Namaste. We've been talking about the ego and the maya, the power of maya and so on. I just remembered a funny story that's worth telling. During the Second World War, there was what they call in America boot camp, where young men are brought to be trained to become soldiers. And there was one boy in this boot camp who was going around the camp, picking up pieces of paper, looking at it. This isn't it. This isn't it. And he kept doing that, and that's all he did. And so finally they recommended him to the camp psychiatrist. And uh, he came into the psychiatrist's office, and he kept picking up pieces of paper off the desk. This isn't it. This isn't it. Finally, the psychiatrist, who couldn't even get him to talk to him, recommended him for a medical discharge. And as soon as he gave him this medical discharge and the boy looked at it, he said, this is it, and he ran out. Well, this is the practice of neti, neti. This isn't it, this isn't it, this isn't it. But it can take a long time that way. You don't want um, this kind of food. You don't want that kind of food. You don't want this kind of person. You don't want that kind of person. You don't want success in this way. It just goes on forever. There's a way of slicing through all that. And that is like Alexander when he cut through the Gordian knot. Cut through the ego. Get rid of the ego. And it's a very fine practice even in your daily life to say to yourself, I remember one time my guru always told me, don't talk from your own knowledge. Ask God to talk through you. And you will see that things work much better that way. And I have found it to be so. But after a talk in Hollywood Church in America many years ago, some lady came up to me and congratulated me on my talk. And I said, well, God is a doer. She said, oh, really? Meaning, oh, I knew it was good. I didn't know it was that good. Well, no, that's not what I mean. Give the credit to him. He does everything. You know, every time you take a breath, you couldn't breathe if God didn't breathe through you. You couldn't think if God didn't think through you. You couldn't walk if God didn't walk through you. It's a very good practice and a wonderfully inspiring one to go out and take a walk into the countryside. Don't have anything to do so that you know your mind isn't on things. Just feel that every step you take, his energy is giving you the strength to move that foot. And everything you hear, if you hear a dog barking, feel that God is talking to you. Feel that it's completely centered in yourself, but in the God within you. And so you hear a dog barking and ask God, what message have you got to say to me through that dog? You hear a car honking. What message have you got through that car? You hear the birds twittering, the wind blowing through the, street, through the trees. Feel that God is saying something to you. And you know he's not in the beginning, but you know the more you practice it, the more you begin to find that he does have a message. I have discovered that he has a message in everything, if I will listen. And because truth is center everywhere, circumference nowhere, that same dog can mean many different things to different people because the truth is in you as well as in the dog. In fact, the dog isn't doing anything deliberately, but God does everything through you. Am I talking nonsense? Well, I'll tell you, it works, and that's the important thing. When you love God, then share your life with him. Feel that everything you do is not only for him, not only as it says in the, big, in the Bhagavad Gita very rightly, nishkam karma, give up desire for the fruits of action, but you must also give up the thought that you are acting. Feel that he is acting through you. And nishkam karma brings you to that point. But we can cut through that Gordian knot and begin at the very beginning. Don't feel that you are doing things. Feel that he is doing it. I have found, actually, this practice to be extraordinary, extraordinarily liberating. For example, in my life, and I'm not boasting, but I am telling a fact, I have written over 400 pieces of music, over 100 books. I've composed, I've, uh, composed over 400 pieces of music, as I said. I've taken 15,000 photographs. I've founded eight communities on three continents. I've given thousands upon thousands of lectures. I've had to do so many things in my life. I don't think very many people could say they have done so many things. 
But you know what my secret has been? I haven't done any of them. I've let him do it through me. Instead, for example, when I've wanted to write a song of saying, well, now do I want the note to go up or down, figuring it all out with my mind, I have said simply, I want a song to say this, 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 and this. Give me a melody. It's there just like that. You will find the more that you let God work through you, the more you don't have to feel the struggle to find the inspiration, the guidance and everything. It's already there. He's already just behind your mind telling you what to do. And so you will see that the less you have of ego consciousness, the more this energy will be able to come up the spine past the medulla to the point of its positive pole, which is the kutastha. You know, there are seven chakras in the spine. This is really the positive center of the sixth chakra. The sixth chakra is the, is the uh, agnya here, and its reflection is in the, in the uh, point between the eyebrows, not in the bone structure. It's the frontal lobe of the brain behind that point here. But the frontal lobe of the brain is the most highly advanced part of the brain. You can see animals have their foreheads go back. They don't have that frontal lobe. Only man has this frontal lobe. And this center back here, that part of the frontal lobe, is the seat of the spiritual eye. It's the seat of inspiration. It's the seat of superconsciousness. That's why you see, when you see saints, they're always looking upward in, in their ecstasy. I saw a thing in a pharmacy window many years ago trying to attract young men to take up the uh, career of pharmacists. And so it showed this young man dreaming of becoming a pharmacist. Well, naturally, they're not going to have him looking like this. He's looking up. Anything that inspires you, you bring your eyes upward, you look upward, everything moves here. This is a physical reality, and you, you can know it from, from yourself. That's why I say people are wiser than they know. These are things that you need to learn from a book. You can recognize them in yourself. All religions, basically, are teaching the same truth. Jesus Christ and Krishna taught the same truth. The only difference about Hinduism <clears throat> is that Hinduism, as it's known today, still teaches Kevalya Moksha. Christianity teaches it, but Christians don't. Buddhism teaches it, but Buddhists don't. Islam, I don't know what they teach. I'm not a Muslim, but I know they don't talk about Moksha. Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita talks about Moksha. The highest principle, and this is why the name Sanatana Dharma, Sanatana Dharma means the eternal religion. And there can be only one religion. It's not the religion of Lakshmi and Ganesha and uh, all those forms and idols, which are really ideal worship, not idol worship. Idols are material objects that you crave. Ideals are things that remind you of God. And even Muslims have that stone in Mecca to which they bow. You can't get away from some material focus for your devotions. It just is human nature. So the Gita says, why not work with human nature as it is? And so it is that the truth of um, superconsciousness and of the spiritual eye and all these things, they're universal truths, but you have to open up this and then the energy, this is a subtle channel opens and this, the Hasasrana, the thousand petaled lotus is the top of the spine. When you have that, you know you don't have to go outward and become one with the infinite outwardly. When you become completely one in yourself, truth is center everywhere, circumference nowhere. We could use this illustration also that uh, you have a lake covered with ice. If you were to try to break through that ice at all points, it would be much too strong even for the most powerful machinery. But if you drill at one little point, you can go through that ice into the lake underneath it. And so if you can drill, science is always trying to go out there and try to find the truth outside. It can never find it. You have to go to the center of it all in yourself. This is why yoga is the supreme science, because it takes you, to the only, takes you by the only path that will lead you to that ultimate reality. 
Science can only explore this aspect, that aspect, many different aspects of truth. It can never take you to that truth, which is fundamental to everything. But Sanatana Dharma is based on this reality. Everything has come from spirit. Everything must merge back into spirit. And all beings, as they are thrown out into this universe, wander five to eight million lives, as I said before, even to reach the human level. And then we may go for a long time. Reincarnation is an inescapable truth. You can't argue it, apart from the fact that so many people even remember their past lives. I can remember some of mine. But the thing is that, that uh, you look at faces in a crowd. Your DNA couldn't produce that. Your parents couldn't give you that. I'm the parents of uh, a father who was very much of a Vaishya. I am not a Vaishya. I'm, my whole life has been dedicated to God. I haven't drawn his qualities into me. I am another kind of person. I just had to have a vehicle into which I was born. But incarnation after incarnation, you can see all these different faces. They could only be produced by many, many, many lifetimes of experience, of suffering, of pain, of hope, of dis uh, disappointment, of experience. I remember I was on a TV show a few months ago here in India, and they were about a hundred people in the room. And somehow I really felt vividly that each one of them had been close to me in another life, either as a relative, as a friend, but it was a very wonderful experience, and they all treated me that way afterwards, too. And when you, the more, I'll tell you this, too, the more you feel bliss in your heart and your soul, the more you can't help loving everybody. Because you see, everybody is looking for that same bliss. And you see that no matter how dark their consciousness may be, they may be criminals, they may be murderers, they may be all kinds of things. But the wonderful thing is that they too are looking for that bliss. We came from Satchitananda, and our goal in life is to find that Satchitananda. We can't, we have no other goal. There are only two things that all human beings long, long for. The first is to avoid pain, yes, obviously. The second is to find happiness. And happiness is a masquerade for Satchitananda, ever existing, ever conscious ever new bliss. And so some person may think that he will get happiness by getting re getting revenge on his enemy, by stealing from murdering, by doing all sorts of things. Some people may think they will be find happiness by having a huge bank account. Other people think they will find it in great physical pleasures, all the things human beings strive for. But this is the one thing that they're looking for, and what you find is through countless incarnations, they pick up bits of paper. No, this isn't it. No, this isn't it. And they think that this will give it to them. You will find that the only people who expect, who have hope, are those who are still on the road. They haven't yet achieved. Those who have all the money they want, they're not happy. Those who have all the sexual pleasure they want, they're miserable. Those who have all the fame they want, they just wish they could get away from the pursuing crowds. Nobody in this world is happy. The, the um, oh dear, what was his name? Um, Howard Hughes, the um, wealthiest man in the world when he was living. A newspaper reporter got to him. He was very reclusive and sort of given up everything. But the reporter asked him this question, are you happy? The wealthiest man in the world. He said, no, I'm not happy. Well, of course he wasn't happy. How can money give you what you're looking for? What you're looking for is your own self. You're thinking it's not this, it's not that. And so for many incarnations, people look hopefully, then at the age of 60, they begin to sort of, the leaves start to turn. By the age of 80, they've fallen and they don't see any hope in life. And they think, oh, I wish I had done this, or I wish I had done that. And for how many lifetimes one keeps seeking. Do you know, in the Bhagavad Gita, it says that at the beginning of a day of Brahma, 
I cast all these souls out again from this state of quiescence into Maya. It's not that they're in cosmic consciousness, they're resting there for the night of Brahma. In the day of Brahma they come out. But do you know that, as it says in another great scripture, which is not known as a scripture, but my guru explained it as such, the Rubaiyat of Omakayam, the meaning of a stanza there is that many souls that come into Maya at the beginning of a day of Brahma are still wandering in delusion at the end of that day of Brahma. And I ask myself with a certain agony or anguish, how many days of Brahma have we been wandering? Somebody said to my guru once, I don't think I have very good karma, master. And he said, remember this, it takes very, very, very good karma even to want to know God. It takes very good karma even to be interested in a program like this. Most people are just thinking of their little baubles. They're not looking for truth. They're not looking for happiness. I'm not talking to the masses, but I am talking to you. If you're awake enough spiritually to want to listen to this program, then listen, because what I'm telling you will give you your liberation. It is the truth of your own being. It is what you were born to know. And so realize this, you are not this ego, and you are not all the things that this ego thinks that it can amass to itself. Get rid of that thought that I am doing it. Get rid of the thought that I am anything. You will find that the more you can think that way, the more you'll be able to do. It's not as if you become apathetic and helpless. Far from it. That power of the universe will infuse you. But, and I want to talk about this again tomorrow, the more you have that consciousness in yourself, the more you have of what you really want, true bliss, joy to you.